Oh! Oh, my bad! Sorry, gang. Didn't see y'all were there. I, uh, you know, just doing some some VR out there, uh, grocery shopping. You know, kind of those, those wild and crazy things. So, you know, gotta get out sometime, so... Figured that one was a good one for me. Oh my goodness, my glasses are all messed up from doing that inside of the VR goggles. Good morning, software engineers. Questions, queries, quandaries. Hope you are having a lovely day today. So, I'm getting the material up and ready, and I'm slowly starting to post things on the schedule. So, keep an eye out there. I will make sure to get more information as soon as possible. But the quick things you need to know right now are, there is no sprint check on Monday architecture docs are not due on Monday. They're going to be due on the 30th. So a week later, um, getting stuff together. I'll let you know. Uh, there was also the announcement from president or the, from the provost actually about the credit, no credit thing. Let me think about that a little bit, how that's going to work for us in particular, because my biggest concern is I don't want people ghosting each other on the projects. It's really important that everyone stick together for the projects because that's a level of stress that folks don't need right now is have to worry about people who are not pulling their weight. So let me think about that and I'll give you some more information about that, how that's going to work. If you're interested in taking that option, that's fine. You know, that's something that the school is doing. I will support you in whatever way that I can, but I want to make sure that everyone is, uh, is getting a fair shake and the projects keep moving as normal. So just, you know, if you have a question about it, send a private post on Piazza or you can, you know, we'll make it time for do chat in, um, in Zoom if necessary. By the way, I have been working on the uh, idea of how we're going to handle office hours. I think I've got a good solution for that. The TAs and I are going to work on it this afternoon, which should be really good as far as doing pulling people in to do screen sharing. It's going to use Zoom and it's going to use Slack, which thankfully enough, those are tools you're pretty good at by now. Uh, as far as lectures go, I think what I'm going to do is once I get some lecture material together, uh, I'm going to do some live streams and then you can post questions during the live stream and I'll just answer them as I go and I'll record those so then you can go back and watch them later. But right now we're going to do just a little bit of lecture today. Um, I'm going to get the new uh, guided practice posted probably Friday um, and you can work on it on the weekend and we'll kind of go from there. So let's catch up with where we are right now and get into the lecture slide. So we're getting into design decomposition. So if you remember from the last video, last lecture, however that works. Um, by the way, uh, if you look at the schedule now, I've removed the dates for most things and I've started putting ON1, ON2, Online1, Online2. So keep a lookout for those to know kind of what the next thing is that you should be doing. Anyway, so we talked last time about modularity. What makes a good module? How do we know that we are building good things. I switched slides. Why did it not switch slides on my screen? That is weird. Let's try it again. All right. Look, computer science professor figures out technology on the fly. Go me. So we know what a good module is. We talked about the idea of information hiding, coupling, and cohesion. So remember, information hiding is the idea that we have a, a module that we don't really care what's going on inside of it. What we care about is here's the input, here's the output, we can change that thing on the inside. Coupling, how close are two modules connected to each other? So in effect, are two modules so dependent that they're really one module and you have to move them all the time, together all the time? Um, or are they nice and separated so that you can pass data between the two? And then there's cohesion. When you make a module, did you make sure that everything in that module is supposed to be there and there's not a lot of extra just junk in there? So when you have a nice cohesive module, then you have a nice chunk of functionality that you can easily move between systems. And then if coupling is low, then it's much easier to pull that module out, put it in another system, and then utilize it right then and there. So those are the things that we're looking for. So given that problem statement, given like a, a, a one pager, here's a software system. I want to be able to build something out of this. What do I do? What do I do? I know what a module is supposed to look like. I know what a good module is. Sheriff told me. So how do we do that? And also, how do we communicate? Remember the whole idea here in the design portion of the course is how do we communicate with other software engineers? Super, super important. So 
There are basically two fundamental ways you can think about this. Nouns, verbs. No, I have not sent you back to the first and second grade class, but nouns and verbs are the two ways we think about decomposition. More, more you know, software engineering-y objects and behaviors or functionality. So you've been doing object-oriented for a very, very long time. You know the idea of, okay, I look at a something and I think, okay, um, in this particular system, I need to have a student and a class and or a song and a playlist and, you know you can think of the objects and you think about how do those objects interact this is how java works this is how um, many modern programming languages work uh, particularly ones that are used to build larger systems but there are also many functional there are other programming languages that are built around the idea of i'm going to build a thing that does a thing it doesn't necessarily have to have a data source that we can model in particular but it needs to be able to work on various types of data sets. It needs to be able to be spun up and spun down in a lot of different, uh, lot of different ways, a lot of different processes, maybe on the fly, things like JavaScript. So Node in particular is really heavily functionally oriented. And the reason this is really cool is because it's functionally oriented, it actually can do things a lot faster than some object oriented things where it has to build this huge memory data structure to understand what all the things are. Node and other things like MapReduce or some other you know algorithms where it's trying to take large data sets. If you don't have to model the data, you're just kind of processing it as you go then you can do things a lot more efficiently. Now, don't get me wrong, that doesn't mean that this functional methodology is the best for everything. It really depends upon the language, it depends upon the uses, it depends upon, it depends upon a lot of things. But today, in this video, we're gonna, func we're gonna focus on what a functional decomposition is, and in the next video, we'll do object-oriented decomposition, then the guided practice is, I'm gonna send you off to do a couple of these. So, we're gonna start focusing on in particular, those verbs. Now, um, this is primarily for languages like C or JavaScript, and in most cases when we build a module, it's gonna be a function. Um, there could be some libraries, but in general, we're talking about some sort of function. And we do this a lot of times with kind of this chronological decomposition. We have a function that does X, function that does Y, function that does Z, and we kind of wanna break out this business process to work through large data sets. I've got a good example we're gonna talk about in just a couple slides. So we're gonna break out each of these functionalities into a different module, and then we'll have some sort of control module that will call each of those in order in order to you know, execute the program. Now, this is really, really common in, um, I'm gonna jump two slides, in so, uh, service-oriented architectures. So the idea of um, you're logging into a, a website and it's going to send off a call to Google, OAuth2, Facebook, Twitter, whatever, and it's going to return with the yes or no that person can log in. That's a that's that's functionality. Then they work a little bit. Maybe they make a purchase. Maybe it's checking. There's a there's a call to some sort of service to determine if something is in stock. Then it comes back and says yes, I'd like to buy that. How about you now? Um, make a payment. So now it sends a call off to Square. So service-oriented architecture is functional decomposition at the high level. And this is super, super common, particularly when we're talking about web systems. We're going to start talking about doing this at a lower level in, at the programming level. I'll back up a slide here. So there are some challenges with doing this. In particular, let's say you're working on a very large CSV file or maybe a database connection or something like that. If you're using object-oriented, you can better create a model for that data. That's what it's meant for. You can better create a model for that data that everyone can access. If everything's a function, then everything has to kind of be told what the data structure is every single time. So functionality works better. Functional decomposition works a lot better when the data set is simple. So like a large JSON file or, you know, something that's easily processed on the fly, not necessarily an array list or something that's going to be much more complex. Um, so you want something that's going to be managed a little bit easier. Also, there's the possibility of data being duplicated or data being stored in multiple places or uh, uh, potentially adjusted in multiple places. 
no SQL databases like Mongo, they specialize in this. Um, and this is intentional because we kind of live in a world where you don't necessarily have, have, have to have everything completely modeled. You can work on things in the short term. Go take database, beta, databases, you'll learn more about that. So there are some problems. It's not going to work for every solution. As a matter of fact, the number one problem, boy, the number one problem that I have with students with functional decomposition is they try to apply it to everything. And they think that, oh, because I can understand the functionality, I can do a breakdown. And I would argue about 75% of the time, it's just not right. We're going to talk about why that is when we get to the examples. So I'm actually going to go to this example. I think this one's a little bit better. See, you're getting the true sheriff lecture experience where I skip slides. So this is a business process right here. So the idea is I'm going to generate a payroll, okay? So that's the first function. Now I want you to look at each of these states, generate, get, read, validate, calculate, calculate, calculate. That's a lot of calculates. Update, calculate, calculate. Verbs. We've got verbs. We've got actions. Each of these is an action, a concrete action. Now generate payroll is the core thing I am trying to do, right? I want to generate the payroll. What does it mean to generate the payroll? Well, I need to get the payroll records. I need to calculate the pay. And I need to print the check. I should do my hands the other way. That works better. Is that better? Eh. Anyway. What does it mean to get the payroll? Well, to get the payroll, we have to read the payroll record and then validate the payroll. Now, I know you're looking at those itty bitty arrows there. What do those arrows mean? First off, please don't get hung up on them. Um, but what the arrows actually are showing is the flow of data. So the open circle shows kind of the start data and the closed circle shows the closed data uh, or the end of the process. So for instance, to generate a payroll, I need to validate the record. In getting the payroll record, I need to read the payroll record. And for each reading of the payroll record, I'm going to, as Sheriff gets really close to the screen, maybe the other one, read the payroll. Yeah, the payroll record is the thing that comes out. <laughs> I left the microphone, sorry. Um, and then it's an end of the file. So I have, this, I have the slides up over here. I'm not like sheriff in profile. It's me looking at slides where it's a little bit bigger. Then um, for each of those payrolls, we're going to validate that record. And that is what's needed in order to get a single payroll record. Then that gets sent back to generate payrolls. Okay, so generate payrolls process now says I have all the payroll records. Awesome. What do I do with it now? <clears throat> now I need to calculate the pay. So it sends a record to calculate pay. To calculate the pay, it calculates the gross pay and the deductions. What does it mean to calculate deductions? The tax and um, withholding Social Security. That's the SS there. And it comes with, not like a not like a ship, like the USS withheld. It's going to calculate Social Security. Comes back to calculate deductions, goes back up to calculate net pay. Now I need to update the report employee record to say, yes, I paid them for this quarter or this month or whatever. Then it goes back up to generate payroll. Then it prints the checks. This is a business process that I can break down into concrete small activities where the data set can be represented in small understandable chunks, right? To generate the payroll, I need a payroll record that can be represented as a CSV, as a JSON, as an XML document, something like that. It's a simple piece of data. And now I'm going to process that data as I work through this tree. Okay, it doesn't make sense to do this for everything. It doesn't make sense necessarily to do this when you're writing a software that is a music player. Music players don't follow a hard and fast, this is the process people follow. Can you go in and do a small one of these for a portion of the system to understand what it means? Okay, they pressed play. I need to allocate, I need to allocate the audio driver. I need to load the file. Absolutely, you can do that. But for this, for this type of system, you're looking at, I have a core functionality I care about, generating a payroll. I can break that functionality into smaller things. And then that lets me as a designer understand better what the step-by-step -step process is in order to communicate with the other software engineers what we're gonna do. So this sort of uh, technique works a lot better with, um, JavaScript with business practices. Sometimes, sometimes it's a web application. Doesn't necessarily have to be. 
We'll get into some examples when we get over to object oriented where I can break it all down for you. I think that's the last one of those. Yep, that's the last slide for those. So that's our quick introduction to functional decomposition. I'll compare it when I get over to object oriented, which I'll record that video next. Next is yet to be defined, but today or tomorrow. And then we will keep on chugging through. So um, gang, I, uh, I hope you're taking care of yourself. Hope you're doing well. Hope you're eating well, having fun, whatever whatever it is that you might uh, be doing at home. I got to do some advising with some students earlier today and, and yesterday, and that was cool. Um, got to see kind of how everyone's coping. So, you know, we're here for you. Uh, the CS department, the faculty, if you need us, let us know. Um, yeah. So uh, more information coming soon. Throw that out there. So hope you're doing well. Look forward to talking to you next time. Bye.